Good morning, all. I hope you had a great evening and a very good morning uh, with a lot of coffee, at least for myself. Um, from ID to production, this is something that I would like to explain to you guys today. So who am I? I'm an engineer, I think like most of you in the room. But I'm also a user, and I don't mean I'm a Windows user or an iPhone user, no. I'm a user of some of the products that, well, great engineers here in the room make and uh, help me or enable me to make the next best thing for our customers. So, therefore, I think like Adele sings, I would like to say uh, hello from the other side. I'm a user of your product and I would like to give a little bit of a different perspective. What does it mean that uh, a large company like the bank where I'm working for uses your products? But before we dive into that, a little bit of a backstory, and uh, trust me, it's going to be short. I work for a very large organization, a Dutch bank, and um, I've been working on mobile banking applications for the past seven years or so. Um, and it was a great ride, but at some moment in time I was given the opportunity to start something new, something from the scratch, uh, something that I love and something that, well, I'm dreaming of and see a great future in. This is called Banking of Things. And this Banking of Things started with a vision. And the vision is, uh, Banking of Things wants to be the global standard for IoT transactions in the future. And why do we want to do that? Well, I think I don't need to explain you guys, but IoT is popping up everywhere. We have connected devices in our rooms, in our cars, in our planes. Maybe even you have a connected toaster or a fridge nowadays. But at least by 2020, we will have, well, 20 billion connected devices. Even if this number is like one or two billion off, it's still a pretty high number. And if we as banking of things can get into a fraction of these devices, I think we can have a very large user base. I will not dive into the internals of what we are doing and how we are doing it today, because I think that's more suitable for a different presentation. But I'm just gonna give you a brief overview. So, your car, it can be connected. And we will supercharge it with banking of things. The same will go for your fridge. It's inevitable. At some moment in time, your fridge will start ordering beer, and we will not be the company that will make the connection to uh, your grocery store, but we will be the company that facilitates and handles the payment for it. And we will also enable your lights. Maybe we can change the business model of Philips and we can create light as a service through our products. <coughs> we want to connect all of these devices together creating a grid to allow offline payments because, well, your fridge might not be online all the time or your car might not have connectivity all the time, but your, some other peripheral in your house might have. So we want to create a grid where things talk to each other, create offline payments for each other and find an exit note and send it to our office. So how do we do it? What have we done over the past months? Well, I don't know how many of you guys know what this is, uh, what I do. It's a mobile rocket launcher from NASA. And I really like this because uh, I think it's a great me metaphor of what we are building at the moment. For them, it doesn't really matter what NASA is going to launch. If it's going to be this rocket, a rocket like this, or freak, maybe like Elon Musk, they're going to launch a car into space, they will be ready for it. And so will, will we be with our platform. It doesn't really matter what kind of an IoT device wants to do a payment, our platform will be ready. So how do we do it? We've created many different building blocks. We've created SDKs for different IoT devices. We've created a completely new backend, completely new frontend. And on a very high overview, uh, this is more or less where we are, well, today. On the top right, you see our sets of SDKs. Uh, we've written a Swift SDK. Node.js, Python, and C. Uh, this way, we feel we can utilize a lot of different devices that are out there. Uh, at the bottom, we have our, well, monolithic layer at the moment, uh, which is a REST API that services all of these things. But to a more interesting point, why Swift? Why did we choose Swift? Because Swift is the foundation of everything that we do. And I can stand here and talk about how it's performant, or I can talk again about uh, how, how low the memory usage is on the surface and how much that will save us in costs. Or maybe I can steal the slide from Tanner saying that the developer, happy uh, developer happiness index will uh, increase a lot if we do this. But although all of these things are really true and it's correct and I cannot argue with any of those, it was not our main reason to do so. So what was our primary, mo primary motivation to switch to, well, from a Java legacy, I think, Java legacy company, 
um, to Swift at the back end. As I already said, uh, I've been an iOS engineer for uh, the past seven to eight years at ING, building mobile banking applications with a great team. Um, everything in Objective-C in the second Swift came out, we jumped on top of it. Uh, we had similar discussions we have today that we had back then. Is Swift production ready? Is it safe enough? Can we use it in a banking application? And we've decided um, to implement Swift in a very, very small feature, which we called Touch ID back then. Uh, and it was proven to be safe. And we kind of embraced it from the first moment on. We fell in love with Swift and we followed the journey all the way through, um, rewriting big parts of our application. And being a Swift developer for years afterwards, it makes sense for us to develop a new backend in Swift. Another thing that was extremely or is extremely important for us is the, reuse, the potential of reusability between code, between the front end and the back ends. Our platform uses mobile applications to, for example, connect devices. These applications are also written in Swift. Our main objective was reuse as much components as we can on the back end and in the front end. We are a startup within a bank. We have limited time, limited funding, and I have to do it with a handful of people uh, making, th making this platform. And choosing this direction, I was sure that we can do it. So this combination is something that we really love. So a little bit about the journey. 15 months we're into it now. 15 months we went from nothing to everything. And it's not every day that you can start with a, well, clear whiteboard and do it all over again, especially not in a larger organization where I'm working. So we had to really think about what we would do next. We already knew that we wanted Swift on the back end 15 months ago, but which framework should we choose? Should we go for the simplicity of perfect, Zero, the greatness uh, of, of Vapor, or well, the, the big IBM with Kutura who could help us out with support? Um, and it, wasn't a it, it was a difficult choice. It wasn't an easy choice. We checked out all the frameworks. We run them all. We did pox. We did tests. And at some moment in time, we had to bite the bullet, and we went for Kitura. And the main reason was, you might ask, why did you do so? We really liked the support we got straight away. Um, we got into contact with the Kutura team. We asked for help. Uh, we got the great feedback that, that we needed. And it really felt also like that they were a startup within a very large organization, just like ourselves. And we immediately kind of like had that click. Uh, and that felt good. So we went over to their, well, enormously large office at Hursley Park, uh, which was a great journey. And as a side note, this is not a sponsored IBM talk, but I really believe that these guys are making a great product. And if you make a great product, I would love to talk uh, good things about it. So this is my point of view at the moment. So we went over, we uh, explained everything that we wanted and that we are about to do. We got the help and the guidance that we needed. Um, but it still felt a little bit like a leap of faith because, well, we just picked this framework, but the other frameworks were well, equally as good. But what, was, what pulled us um, over the line was the enterprise relationship ship that uh, the guys at IBM have with Apple, uh, Ian and Chris being on the steering committee back then. There was something that we valued a lot because we were really hoping that the Kitura updates would follow the Swift updates as well. And of course, they released 24-7 Swift commercial support for Kitura and Swift. Um, yeah, and this was something that we as a bank at least need because you have to understand, we were uh, this little startup in a large organization that is Java, and we kind of knew what we were doing, but we needed support, and we got the support from those guys. So it felt like we now <coughs> had a little bit of a compass, and we had a direction where we want to go. We had a strong vision, we have a strong vision, what we want to do, and we started building. We started building our first prototype, and well, I don't know if you ever navigated through a forest or uh, anything else with a compass. It would help you, but it, it's definitely not turn but turn directions. So we kind of felt like Jack Sparrow on that ship. You know, it was leading us to the thing we wanted the most, and it was a successful Swift in production on the back end within a larger organization. But we didn't really know how to get there yet. <coughs> this was September 2017. Um, we know that we were on the path to success because this we gave up our day jobs to do this. Um, we didn't really know how we would get to success, but we knew that we would make it. So now chosen Kutura, it felt like the compass could go and we had kind of like turn by turn satellite navigation. So coming back to this slide, uh, I think I would like to add, add Kutura in the mix because this is our weapon of choice. This is how we build our backend and this is what's working for us at the moment. 
Having said that, there were many, many different challenges we had to overcome. And I would like to highlight a couple because if we can do it, I'm sure you guys can do it as well. But I don't want you guys to make the same pitfalls and mistakes as we did. So the biggest problem was the mentality within the company. Um, as I said, coming from a Java company, uh, everyone already said, guys, you cannot do this in Swift. It's not ready. Um, what is this language anyway? It's only supported by Apple. So before I could write one line of code, having to convince many other people to get started was the biggest problem. So managing uh, the people above you, and motivating your choice was a difficult one. The other one again was the paradigm shift. Being a mobile developer for the last seven years, only working on mobile banking applications, uh, suddenly I was full stack again, and I felt like I was back in my PHP era, um, developing backends and frontends. I had to think from you know nice, beautiful applications to stateless backends, and that was a different mindset. And I had to give that mindset also to the people I work with, and I think that was quite challenging for us as well. So the biggest question, of course, is it production ready? Can we release this thing into production? Well, the answer to that is yes. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> the answer is yes, you can run it in production, and we are doing it at the moment. <coughs> we are doing it. We have done a number of pilots. Uh, we have a closed beta with 500 developers at the moment playing around with our SDKs, with our portal, with our website, with our mobile applications, all being served from our Swift backend. <coughs> Another very difficult thing, finding proper expertise. I'm so happy to be here in this room among you guys. I mean, we all do similar things and we believe in Swift on the backend and it's gonna be big. And it doesn't really matter if it's gonna be Favor, Kitura or whatever, it can happen. Um, for us, it was difficult to find that enthusiast who wanted to help us out, uh, that engineer who would let go his other job, uh, also started to believe in Swift on the back end and join our team. So having tackled that, we hit the biggest, uh, biggest wall of them all, and I think it was infrastructure. Thank God we could deploy very quickly to the Cloud Foundry applications and we could, uh, we could host our software there. But being, again, being uh, constrained by a very large enterprise organization, they said, no, you have to host your stuff within our own data centers. And this is a bit of a problem. So we couldn't solve this back then, and we can solve it today. So I'll tell you a little bit later how we're going to do it. So on the path of success, we've done numbers of pilots with, well, very large German car manufacturers, uh, smaller Dutch companies, and well, actually companies all over Europe. We've done pilots, we've proven that our system can work, we've proven that we can enable IoT payments, and we advanced into a closed beta community, and I really hope I can invite all of you pretty soon to show you guys what we're doing. We have active developers taking our SDKs, developing the next big thing on top of what we've built, and we are, well, almost ready to go fully publicly live to the world. And this will happen somewhere this year, but I can't give you a definite date yet. I think the most important part of this talk is the lessons learned, because, wow, there were so many things we hit every day again, and so many new things that we learned, so many tricks that we were taught. But I think the biggest one, and the biggest failure of all was Swift Package Manager. We really thought that Swift Package Manager would be like uh, our silver bullet, and we really thought that it would help us reuse a lot of code between the front and the back end. But uh, as it turned out, uh, after my colleague Nandini talked to the guys from the Package Manager team, the Package Manager will not be ready for iOS any day soon. So we had to come up with a clever solution for that, and we used Swift Package Manager on the back end to get all of our dependencies, all of our own internal frameworks, and we do, that, we do the same thing by using Git submodules on the front end nowadays. It's a little bit of a workaround, but it works perfectly for us. Waiting for the day that it will work fully with Swift Package Manager, though. And there's this other thing. And um, yesterday, uh, there was also talks about Vapor and all the different uh, packages and, and frameworks that are being developed for all the different frameworks which is a great thing. I mean, the community is very active and we get new stuff every day and we got so much to choose from, from. But this felt a little bit overwhelming for me because I didn't really know what to choose from, what should I use, what should, it, 
what should I not use, what have long time support and what will well die soon. And it felt like I was configuring other people's stuff instead of building my own. Because remember, I left my day job to do this. I'm an engineer, I wanted to build the next big thing from the scratch. But now I'm dragging in all of your packages, which is good because you did a lot of heavy lifting for me. But I found myself at some moment in time dismantling some of your packages and uh, just taking the bits and pieces that I thought was necessary for my own product. So finding that sweet spot there between reusing everything that the community makes and building something I'm really comfortable with uh, is still challenging even today. Coming back to the Swift Packet Manager, it kind of feels like this. When I do a Swift update, uh, it drags in the whole world to uh, my project. And coming from a banking background, uh, this is not something that I want because clean code is something that I value a lot. Not having too many third-party dependencies is even more important to me because I need to secure review everything and I need to be sure that every single line of code that was written well, was kind of the right one. So again, here I kind of feel out of control, not completely sure what is being dragged into my backend. So just before I go live, just before I have a secure pen test or a secure code review, I have to go through every dependency and really see if you guys are also updating uh, the stuff that is out there. And this is kind of the situation that it is right now, but it's something that's costing me a lot of time. So um, coming back to what I said earlier, sometimes I rewrite stuff that you already did just to make sure I do not have too many dependencies. So the future, uh, the future is bright because we had a lot of uh, skeptical people and a lot of people who said you cannot do it, but we did it. We are live, as I said, with a well, select group of developers building stuff upon our, our framework but we still have a lot of challenges to overcome. Uh, we went with a very monolithical approach right now. We are one big thing, we are one big bloated backend, and we want to move to microservices. And yesterday there was a great talk about it, and it really inspired me and opened my eyes because uh, there were talks about the pros and the cons of it. We all know that Swift can be very good for microservices, but does it make sense for us to do it right now? Um, we have a very short time frame to launch, we have a very short time frame to do this right, and we can only do it right once. And if we fail, we fail miserably, I think. So choosing the time where we go from the monolithical approach to microservices is something that we're struggling with. Deploying to different clouds. We're hosting in the Cloud Foundry application at the moment at IBM, but we are dockerizing everything and hosting it on different data centers and different services. We want to be able to switch to any data center that we want at any moment in time. If it's our own internal data center, which is called ING Private Cloud, AWS, or still at IBM, we want to be ready for everything. So this is something that we're putting a lot of time in. Uh, dockerizing everything, making it flexible, making different failovers uh, across different data centers. And then something else, uniformity. Um, if you remember the slide a couple slides back where I showed you a very high level overview of our architecture, you saw that at the top left, our web interface, our portals, they are all written in Angular, JavaScript, and this is not something that we wanted so far. The reason for that is that, again, we had little time and we hit the ground running. Um, and by, by not being able to immediately, for example, find the right expertises that helps us out with creating templates in mustache or in stencil, surfing HTML web pages, we had to try something else and we had to hire other people who would develop our front end. And one could argue, were you already at that moment building your own legacy? I don't know. But we want to go back to uniformity. We want to go back to one single backend, Swift serving our backend, our websites, and serving everything to our I IoT devices. <coughs> so far, it really has been a great ride. It's amazing. Um, it felt like, well, the best thing ever. Uh, writing backends in Swift is almost seamlessly it works. Uh, all of the points that you guys are uh, said are valid. Low, low, memory, lo low memory usage, low CPA, CPU usage, and it just works. We can reuse a lot of our code that we want. And I think that if we can do it in such a large organization as IBM, if we can manage all our stakeholders, and if we can manage to pull off to build a new product within 50 months, I'm sure you guys can all do the same thing. So I really hope that I inspire you a little bit to put aside the doubts that you might have if it's production ready or not, because it is. We're running in production. And if you can convince other people within your organization, because you can. And if you want to do it, you have to do it. 
I mean, we are taking this thing to the moon and back because I really believe in that what we are doing is the right thing and the way we are doing it is the right thing. And I really hope that you will build the next big thing. So having said that, I want to get hand it over to Ian, uh, who's going to explain a little bit about uh, what we use to build upon. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Pim, for agreeing to come along and give that presentation about what they've been doing at ING, which I think is really super cool. Um, uh, my name's Ian Partridge. I'm currently leading the Kitura team in IBM, and like Pim said, we're basically a tiny startup hiding inside a huge organization. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is um, what everyone's been asking me yesterday, over lunch, over coffee. What's adoption like? How, how is it going? How is Swift on the server building? What, what can IBM tell me about that? And you've seen, obviously, that ING have been building a fantastic product and are now in production using Swift on the server. Um, Pim said some very nice things about the Kitura team, which is, which is lovely of him, but I, I have to say that the amazing thing, um, well, not amazing, but the wonderful thing was um, how little help ING have actually needed from us. Um, we met them, they came over to, to our office, and we kind of uh, helped them on, a, on our path, but really it's, it's them. They've, they've built everything themselves from scratch, and in terms of kind of day-to-day -day technical support, it's been really quite minimal on our side. So ING are doing great things. Um, another company that we've been uh, we've been working with is Mercedes Benz. Um, they have a they have an app uh, which uh, is all to do with like a it's a virtual assistant for your car, and and the back end for that is written in Kitura, um, which is which is also in production. Um, we also have a number of other companies we're working with who I can't I can't quite name yet. One is a big agritech company who has a an internal iOS app which talks to a Kitura back end. Uh, and finally, a digital bank who are, uh, who've been evaluating Kitura in terms of uh, making it certified for their internal cloud platform. Um, so I hope we'll be able to share more about that in the future. In terms of some raw or relative numbers, um, over the last year, uh, the number of downloads of Kitura has increased by more than four times. Um, adoption uh, has, been, has been strong as far as we can see. And when we look at the amount of server-side Swift, this is not necessarily Kitura, but the amount of server-side Swift that's running in IBM Cloud, the numbers, we're now measuring it in four digits, um, which is great to see. And um, in terms of what that means, that in if this for Cloud Foundry applications, the numbers are comparable with, with Ruby running on IBM Cloud now, which is great to see. And we continue to see strong growth. Um, so, Let's take a step back, though, and think about where we started and how we got on this path. And I have to say, uh, strange to do this at this conference, but it really all starts with JavaScript. Um, so um, IBM has a lot of experience um, in the Node.js no community. And when we decided we were going to build something, we looked for a tried and tested, a proven model uh, of what a web framework might look like. Uh, remember, this is the days when Back in the Swift 2.2 days, when uh, the same time we were trying to port libdispatch to Linux, we were trying to bootstrap enough of foundation that we could do useful things with it. Um, and so we really ne didn't need to be reinventing web frameworks as well. Um, and so here's some JavaScript, right? This is the very simplest Express.js application uh, where you get a request and response and you return what you want. And so we thought, well, how can we make that model and translate it to Swift? And this is what we did. Um, and this is, a, this is a proven model, and in fact, even uh, there was a new Java framework released by Oracle just last week, and we kind of went on their website and thought, oh, wow, they've been reading our website. <laughs> but may, may, maybe there's lots of frameworks that look like this. Um, but what people really want to do is something like this. They want to have Swift on the front end, they want to talk JSON REST to an HTTP back end, um, and then they want to have Swift on the back end as well. And the problem was that back in these original days, this was actually surprisingly painful to do. Uh, if you wanted to take JSON off the wire in Kitura and, and translate it to a local dictionary, um, it, was a, it was a really painful experience to do. Um, now, of course, everyone knows, and we had a talk about it yesterday, that Codable is really the feature that's kind of saved this 
saved Swift from this pain. And so uh, one of the first things we did with our existing APIs in Katura, so this is the ones which take a request and a response and the next route that you want to call, was to just add some helpers on the front end. So here you can read out of the request uh, into a particular type, and we just run the JSON decoder, and all is well. Um, so that's nice, and it simplifies things for people, but it's not really... Uh, what we wanted people to have. We wanted uh, to be able to abstract away uh, even more of the kind of boilerplate that people were having to write. Um, so what you don't see in this code is what you do if, if how, you, how you handle it if you can't decode the type correctly, for example. And so we created a kind of new uh, series of APIs which we call codable routing in, um, in Kutura 2. And the idea here was that all of the decoding should happen before you're before you even get the data. So uh, here we're going to be handling a post on slash profile, and before the handler is even called, all the decoding takes place. Um, this is obviously uh, a lot better <coughs> in terms of the framework is going to handle stuff for you, so if, it's, if, if there's an error, um, the framework will return that for you. Um, and it's a more flexible model. And basically, everything, everything we've been doing over the last year has kind of had Codable involved in it. So if you look at pretty much any of the features that we've added to Katora over the last year, all of them have had Codable in them at some, at some place. Um, so what has been happening over the last year? How has Katora been evolving? Um, well, as I say, Katora 2 was released just over a year ago. That was the one which required Swift 4 uh, had the initial codable routing support. And since then, we've been kind of doing incremental releases. So maybe we've done about five or six in the last year. Each one kind of uh, adding new features, uh, building on what came before, but while keeping the same stable API which people have built on top of successfully and, uh, and like. Um, so uh, Katora 2.5 was released uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, that's the first one where we also provide support for Swift Neo, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Um, but I do just want to focus on one, uh, one thing that we released. So this is what actually came in Katura 2.4, and that's uh, our support for OpenAPI. So quick show of hands, who's familiar with OpenAPI? OK, so it's about half the room. Yeah, so Open API is a description format for your REST APIs. Um, it's wildly popular in the microservices uh, uh, community. What it lets you do is to declaratively document your entire API. So if you're going to, for example, have some endpoints, uh, for example, uh, like slash users or whatever, and that's going to be a post, you document that and in a format which is defined with a specification. Uh, for each of those endpoints, you can define the input and output parameters. You can define the status codes. And uh, in the latest version, you can also uh, document what kind of authentication is on that route, for example, OAuth. And the great thing about OpenAPI is the ecosystem around it. Uh, it's incredibly broad. So there are a wide variety of tools. Um, one of the most popular is probably the Swagger Editor, which is a browser-based tool which lets you create Swagger and OpenAPI <coughs> documents by hand. Then there's a tool called Swagger UI, which I'll show you in a minute, um, which is uh, a kind of te a test bed for, for exercising your REST APIs in the browser. And the final one is called Swagger Code Gen, and what this lets you do is take the definition of your REST API and do code generation against it across a whole variety of languages, frameworks, and platforms. So it means you can take the definition of your REST API and auto-generate, for example, an iOS SDK. So what does this look like in practice inside Kitura? I've just got a short video I'm going to play for you to kind of just, just show what, what the development experience is like when you're doing this. Uh, so I've got a, a basic Kitura project. This has just been scaffolded out of our starter, which has um, a bunch of packages in it to make sure that your application's already cloud ready. And I'm just going to press run on the application and run it here. And you can see that the uh, HTTP server is listening. So uh, let's go quickly. Uh, you can see that there's the Kitura <coughs> splash screen. But as I said, we're all we're cloud ready out of the box, so there's automatically an endpoint on slash health, 
which returns a little a pocket of JSON there. Uh, y slash health, because that's what the Kubernetes orchestrator expects to be able to ping your application on, and it will kill it if it's not there. And here is the slash open API. So this is the uh, generated JSON, which so Kitora is internally kind of uh, instrumenting itself to, to determine what routes are on your application. Uh, and this is, this is Swagger UI. So here you can see that it, we have that dot he slash health route, which is the one which is uh, going to return that status check for us. And we can just click try it out and try it out immediately in the browser. It will show you what the curl command would be, and it shows that you get HTTP 200 back, which is a successful response. So this is really nice. We haven't actually written any routes yet ourselves. We've just got the free health route, which came out of the box. Um, let's add some routes. Let's do some codable routing ourselves. So here, I'm just going to do a simple user struct. We're going to have two fields in it. It's going to have a name, and it's going to have an ID, I think. And I'm just going to create a route, which is going to allow us to post to that. Oh, don't forget, it's going to have to be codable, because it's going to use the JSON decoder on the way in and the way out. Um, I'm just doing all this in one file, just for the sake of a quick demonstration. Obviously, you wouldn't actually architect your application like this. Um, so we're going to do a post on slash users. Uh, and here's the function we want to get called if and when that post actually happens. And what does that look like? So it's just a simple function. Now it's going to take the user, which will have already been decoded by Kitora on the way in. And then we're going to have our respond with closure, which uh, has two parameters. So either we're going to return with an array of users, or, or sim just one user, or we're going to return with a request error. So the best practice for REST on a post is that you, you return the thing that got posted as well. So let's do a, start off with just a simple echo handler. So we're going to take the user that we received into the function, and we're going to respond with sending it back. So this is, this is not actually persisting the post. This is just echoing it back to the user. But you've got to start somewhere. So if we rerun that, uh, and open Safari again, we should be able to see if we go back to our Swagger definition, which is being automatically generated by Kitora on the fly, that now we have a whole bunch, well, we have our extra route, right, which is a post which consumes application JSON and produces application JSON. And you can see the definition for it there. If we go to Swagger UI, which is also running live in the process, you can see we now have our two routes. And so uh, if we go to our post, we can tr try it out. So let's just change a few fields in there uh, and click Execute. And it will run against the live Kitora server. And we get 201 back, which is the HTTP code for created. Note that when we wrote our root handler, we didn't have to set the HTTP status response to 201 in our, in our code. That was all handled for us. And uh, there you go, you can change it, and it all happens exactly the same. But let's do something wrong. Let's, instead of an integer, let's pass a string as the ID. Uh, what do we get back then? Well, we get back 422, which is the HTTP code for unprocessable entity. And the point here is that Katora knows that that's the right thing to return in this example. And you can see that down at the bottom, we get a codable error message, which said, we expected to decode an int, but we found a string instead. OK, so all we've done so far is just echo back to the user what they sent us. Let's actually persist this to a database. And so I've got some uh, kind of a little bit of pre-canned code to do persistence. So here, this is setting up a connection to a Postgres database. We create a pool of connections so that we can handle concurrency, more than one simultaneous connection to the database. Uh, and in our initializer, we're just going to create a table. So now, instead of just echoing the user object back to the user, we're going to pass our, our callback through to the ORM. So we're going to call user.save and then pass the respond with back. And this is going to persist it to Postgres instead of just uh, throwing it away when we echo it back. So let's go back to Swagger UI, and we can see we've got the same route we had before, which is nice. Um, so if we click try it out, we should be able to put something in there, and this time, we'll be actually putting it in the database. So if we click Execute, there we go. We get the same 201 back that we got last time. 
um, but this time it's being saved in the database. Okay, so now we need to get back what we've put in the database. So let's do a quick get root, which is gonna have a very similar kind of signature than the post had. Of course, the difference is on a get, you're not gonna be sending anything in, we're only just retrieving things. So the signature for the function doesn't receive a user. All it has is the respond with handle. <laughs> what are we gonna respond with? Well, we're gonna respond with either an array of users or an error if we're unable to get the users for some reason. And what will that look like? Uh, well, what we'd have to do is retrieve the users from the ORM. So and here's how you do that for our, in our ORM, you do user.findall and pass through the callback. So the ORM does the query and then calls the callback. And of course, if there's some problem with the database, then it returns the right thing and we don't have to handle that in our code. So back to Swagger UI. And now this time, if we go to uh, have a look at the live routes, you can see that we've got our get route as well. And if we exercise the get route, well, we should get back the thing that we put in the database last time. Yep, and there's David, he's still in the database. So now we have both get and post, and we've been able to scaffold out these APIs in literally just a few minutes. Uh, and what, what Swag UI really enables is a closed circuit feedback loop for developers, so you're not having to break out curl all the time, you're not having to use tools like Postman, you can just work straight uh, with your web app and build things out. So there we've put another entry in the database, She's called Harriet. Um, and what we should be able to do finally is if we run a get query, then we can see the two things coming back from the database. So that's pretty cool. Um, I just want to show you one more thing, which is um, how you would do filtering. So, uh, so far, we've just been getting everything from the database, but how would you do a filter on that? Um, so we, our filtering model is based on the query parameters that you can pass on the end of a URL, you know, like question mark, key value pairs. And so we have this protocol called query params, which you make your, uh, you, you create a struct which conforms to it. And so this is basically saying, uh, I want uh, to, to filter on a particular name. So I've got this struct, which is gonna get passed in, which is my query struct which may or may not be there. Um, so if it's not there, that's because you didn't put the question mark on the end of the URL with the filter. Um, if it is there, you did. And we just pass that user query straight through down to the ORM. So you say, find all the users matching that query. And once you're done, call the respond with. Um, so back to Swagger UI to see what that actually looks like. And now, if I open the get root, uh, it's changed slightly. When I do try it out, I now have the option to provide a name. So if I don't, then it just returns all of them, which is fine. Uh, but if I do provide a name, for example, David, who we know is there in the database, then it, you can see the, the curl command now has the, uh, has the query parameters on the end. And let's look for Joe, he's not in the database, so we get nothing back. So that's a simple way to, to do some quick filtering. So I hope you've, I hope that kind of shows how uh, query param, uh, sorry, how open API is kind of baked into Kitura now. And the key thing is that the open API definition was being regenerated dynamically at Kitura startup. Um, what this means is that your application code can't get out of sync with the open API definition because the definition is generated <laughs> automatically from the code. And this is a really big deal because traditional Swagger and open API applications have the massive problem that uh, someone changes the code and they don't remember to update the Swagger document and then the two things get out of sync. And of course, you've uploaded your Swagger document to your API gateway and now the application on the back end doesn't match what the API gateway is expecting. So we think this is really cool um, and we're really interested to see what people think about this and we've loads of ideas of what <laughs> of things we could do to uh, kind of make more progress in this area. So uh, that arrived in Kitura 2.4 uh, a few months ago. Um, 
Keturah 2.5, which was just a few weeks ago, um, had our first support uh, officially for Swift Neo. We had an experimental branch before that, but now with Keturah 2.5, you can choose to run with Swift Neo if you want to. Um, the Swift Neo team really need to get themselves a logo, otherwise everyone's just going to keep using that emoji. <laughs> um, so, uh, obviously, Swift Neo is, is, is an async framework for Swift. Why is it particularly interesting to us? Well, it's interesting to us because it's a port of Netty. And uh, as, I, as you may know, a lot of the team in IBM who work on Kitora come from a background in enterprise Java. And so we're very familiar with Netty and uh, all the ap great applications which were written on top of it. In fact, some of our team were involved in uh, porting Apache Spark to IBM Java, which runs on top of Netty, and some of the complexities that came up there. So, so we, we are very familiar with that model. Um, as I say, it's supported in Kitora 2.5, so if you want to, you can build your Kitora application with uh, Swift Neo, and we'd love you to do that. Um, but it's not just HTTP, it's not just the web server, which supports Swift Neo if you want to. Also, our WebSocket package was rewritten, so that sits on top of Swift Neo's WebSocket package. As I say, we really need some feedback on this. Um, at the moment, it's opt-in. Um, there are still some performance workloads that we test uh, where, the, where it's not quite where we want it to be, so we need to do some more work. But what, what, what it really needs from our users is feedback. We need people to just build their applications with it, run them. It's a simple command line switch. You can just switch from one to the other uh, straight immediately. It's not difficult to do. Um, so if you are a Katura user, and I know there's people in the room who are, I would really encourage you to build with Swift Neo, try it out, and let us know what your experience is. How was our port to Swift Neo roughly done? So tradition, Katura has had a kind of three main things in its stack. There's the web framework on the top, there was Katura Net in the middle, which was the HTTP server, and then there was our socket library on the bottom. And we wrote all of those uh, uh, from scratch, um, some of it which was a pretty painful experience. Um, what does Kitora, what does Swift Neo enable for us? Well, it means we can do this, right? Um, so Swift Neo does all the heavy lifting for us at the bottom, and on top of that, we have a, a thin library called Kitora Neo, um, which is basically an implementation of our Kitora Net API, but sitting on top of Swift Neo, and that's much thinner than Kitora Net was originally, obviously. Um, so. Uh, that, let, that lets us move to Swift Neo with zero code changes needed in Kitura. So if you have an existing Kitura application, you can switch over without having to make a single code, a single line of change in your code. But as I said, it's not just about uh, Kitura applications and uh, the web server and HTTP. It's also about WebSocket. So really, Neo's taking over the world <laughs> in that we've re-implemented our WebSocket library on top of Neo. Um, and uh, you can see I've made that box very small in the top right, and that's because the amount of code in our, our WebSocket package was, was halved as a result of this as well. So, all good stuff. Where are we going in the future? Well, it's really all about enabling a cloud-native Swift ecosystem. Um, I want to talk about a few technologies that we think are really key. And there's been a lot of talk about deployment at this conference and different environments and uh, different platforms and where, what the best option is. And I want to kind of give uh, kind of our view on what we, where we think the in the industry is moving to and the technologies that are going to be key for Swift and microservices in general. Uh, so. Uh, <coughs> Cloud Foundry is still really important. IBM has a, a, a big Cloud Foundry installation. Uh, I, Pim mentioned earlier that ING are running on Cloud Foundry. Uh, and if you scaffold a Kitora application, it comes with all the configuration you need to just CF push straight to production uh, without having to make any changes. Um, Docker is crucial, but Docker alone isn't enough. Um, Docker needs uh, an orchestration system around it. You're not just going to have one microservice. You're going to have a cluster of microservices, and you're going to need something to manage that cluster. And really, the whole industry, I think, is, is moving towards Kubernetes at a, a rate of knots. Um, good metaphor, actually, because it's all about ships. <laughs> um, Kubernetes itself may not be enough. Um, if you've got uh, a complex environment with dependencies, let's say you've got a Kitura application which is going to depend on a database, and maybe you've got uh, another microservice you're going to depend on, you're going to need some kind of 
cluster or package management, and the key technology for that is an open source project called Helm. This is basically a package manager for Kubernetes. So just like on Ubuntu, you would type apt-get install a package, and that will pull down a package and all its dependencies. Uh, what you do is you do hel Helm install my application, and it, look, it installs all the dependencies. So if you, uh, for example, if you have a database, it would install the database into the cluster, start the database up. Once the database is started, it will start install your Kotura application, start it up, and it will manage those as a, as a kind of homogeneous application. Um, and once you're in production, once it's running, you're going to need to monitor it, and the two key technologies that, that have emerged for that are Prometheus and Grafana. So Prometheus is a metrics uh, platform uh, which has excellent support for Kubernetes. And if you scaffold a Kotura application, by default we include our Swift metrics library which provides the metrics endpoints which Prometheus expects. So it, retur it means that uh, your, your Kubernetes cluster will automatically know things like what, how much memory the Swift application is using, how much CPU the application is using, how many HTTP requests it's received, what the average latency has been on the, in Kotura, all those kind of things. And we report all those metrics back out to Prometheus automatically. Uh, and then Grafana is the visualization tool. This is what gives you pretty graphs um, so that your operations people can sit back and drink their coffee and watch the graphs. Nice, flat, low memory usage, it's good. Um, so, um, those are some of the key technologies that we think are really important for server-side Swift and microservices in general. Um, we, we've got loads more to do. It's been great talking to Kitura users here at this conference. Um, if we haven't exchanged contact details, please come and say hi over coffee. We'd love to know who's using our stuff. One of the wonderful things about open source is that anyone can use it. One of the slightly scary things about open source is anyone can use it, right? <laughs> um, and so it's fantastic finding out what people are doing with our stuff. So come and say hi over coffee, and uh, let's, let's hear more about what you're building with Kitura. Thanks so much.